afternoon. My name is Maggie O'Quinn. I'm Modern Marketing's new business development manager, and presenting today will be our principals, Michael Youth and Danette Amstein. Michael and Danette first presented this research at the annual meet conference in Dallas in last month, and we are delighted again to share our key findings about today's meat eaters that can help you better target your unique customer base. A few housekeeping questions, um, comments before we get started. Please submit your questions via the chat box throughout the webinar, and we're going to try to answer as many of those as we can during the end. And today we're going to be moving at a very fast pace, so we're going to be moving quickly in order to allow time at the end for questions. So we also are going to let you know at the end how you can purchase the full research report to do a deeper dive into your specific business. So let's get started. Michael, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, Maggie, and good afternoon. We're very excited to be with you today to share our meat consumer segmentation research. But before we begin exploring the six segments we've identified, we thought it would be helpful to outline what a segment research study is actually designed to do. In its very basic form, segmentation is about surveying individuals within a population and subdividing them into clearly defined segments having similar needs, wants, and demand characteristics. In order for a segment uh, to be solid, it must be definable, which we take care of through attitudes, accessible, where we look at a full scope of demographics, accountable, which means it's measurable, and finally, it's targetable. For those of us who are in marketing, we want to be able to actually um, identify uh, opportunities to talk with specific consumers. Each resulting segment then is defined or linked together by their beliefs and their behaviors. So a little bit about the background on how we executed this survey. In December of 2016, we went out and, and collected a, uh, responses from a nationally representative sample of 2,200 consumers. They were all 18 years or older, and they have had to have purchased meat within the last three months. Here we focused on the purchase of meat at home for at home, uh, for at home consumption, not away from home. So we did not include any information um, in this survey about food service. That would have added a, a, an entirely new dimension to the, to the study, and we wanted to may, remain focused on at home consumption for this particular segmentation. We covered things in the survey like gender, income, generations, ethnicity, and regions. And just a note for the regions, we looked at four different regions for this survey, the West, the Midwest, the Northeast, and the South. So from a design perspective, we dug in from four different perspectives, and the first is the usage of products. In this part of the survey, we talked about meat category usage, things like brand use and the importance of branding, shopping behavior, what happens before you go to the store, and what, go, what happens once you're in the store. We also looked at attitudes. We asked participants many questions about their attitudes, beliefs, perceptions regarding meat, as well as food and life in general. Our goal with these attitudinal questions was to understand their basic belief structure from a holistic perspective, and then ultimately narrow the focus down to meat. We also look at influences. We had a series of questions designed to determine how and where they get and use information that impacts their purchase behavior. This includes pre, during, and post shopping. It includes looking at uh, paper or circulars, talking to family and friends, researching online, making shopping lists, etc. And finally, as we mentioned, we got a full set of demographics on all the consumers. Now, before we get into the research, I wanted to share with you a little bit of, of uh, uh, information on, on the numbers that you're going to see. Obviously, this is a research study and we, we cover a lot of numbers. If you see a black number, it helps you put in relative to perspective that it is on average with what we see across the six segments. We're going to be sharing uh, information on six distinct segments. We're going to do a deep dive into each of the six segments, but we also want you to have a feel for how each of the segments compare against average numbers across the six segments. So again, if you see a black number, it means that on average, the number we're sharing for that particular segment is on average with what we see across all six segments. You see a green number like this green 88, 
that means that the number is significantly higher or indexes higher than the numbers we see across all six segments on average. And if you see a red number, that means it's significantly lower than what we see across the uh, six segment average. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Danette and we're going to get started with our first segment, the voracious carnivores. Thanks, Michael. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We are so excited to share these six segments with you. And I'm really excited to start with one of our most enthusiastic users, the segment we are happy to call the voracious carnivores. They account for 14% of the population. Now, as we go through this next section, I'm going to take a little bit more time in the voracious carnivores than we will in the other segments to kind of outline the information that we'll share. And then you'll see that same information repeated that you can start to compare and contrast between segments. So I'll be sharing consumption information, attitudes, and Michael will be sharing demographic information. If we look at this, this number right here, but one of the first things we wanted to do was understand reported consumption habits. So the ferocious carnivores are absolutely meat eaters. They love the taste of meat. They eat it regularly. They feel like a meal isn't a meal if there's not meat at the center of the plate. They're, they're, we're big fans of, of this segment. Uh, given that, we, one of the questions that we ask the segment is, which of the following products have you or a member of your household eaten at home in the last three months? Now, the proteins you see on the screen are the list that they had to choose from. You'll note that we've included a few outliers, deli, fish, meat alternatives, specialty meats. We did that so that we could record consumption for each of them separately, and we're not going to focus on them here today, but we do have that data that shows how the groups break out into each one of those areas. So with this group, we know that the number is red, excuse me, green, as Michael said. So their, their types of meat consumed in the, in the time frame we asked them about is significantly higher than the average of the group at 6.3%, excuse me, 6.3%. The next question we asked was that about an indicator that shows how frequently participants purchase meat. The question we asked was, in general, how often do you buy each of the following meat and, prod and poultry products? Now, for this question, we narrowed the focus down to and the main six uh, proteins. 65% of the voracious carnivores said that they buy meat and poultry once a month or more frequently. And this number is in red because it's significantly less than what we have for consumers across all of the, all of the segments. What this tells us is that even though the voracious carnivore is a huge meat eater, they are not a frequent shopper. They tend uh, to go to multiple stores uh, less frequently. They typically like to only shop once or twice, uh, once a week, and their freezers, they keep them full. So they're likely to only shop just, just every now and then, not the ones that are going to be in, in the stores on a, on a regular basis. The final consumption indicator that we will share with you today uh, is reported consumption change over the last 12 months. In particular, our question was, how has your frequency of eating meat and poultry at home changed in the last year? So this is self-reported data. This is not based on sales data. This is them telling us how they think they've changed. For the voracious carnivore, over half, 55%, said that their consumption has stayed about the same. Now that number is in green because it's significantly higher than the other segments. And for it to stay the same in this group, remember they're, they're some of our best consumers. They eat a lot of meat. That's good. That means that they didn't trade out of meat. They stuck in there with us uh, while prices were a little bit higher. The 27%, uh, which is in red, says that they have increased consumption. So their number for increasing consumption is significantly lower than the average across the, our consumers. But again, these are heavy meat users. So the fact uh, that only 27% said their increase is not something to be concerned about. They're eating a lot of meat and they're very valuable to us in the industry. The next area that we wanted to look at was how they are influenced before they come to the store. So what are their pre-shopping behaviors and how can those of us that are trying to market to them best impact them? You know, we, as we look at these here, there's, there's several things I should note. There are a lot of indicators we could share with you because there's a variety of questions. We're only going to they're going to focus on on five here for each of the segments today. We can we do have the ability to dive to dive deeper if you'd like. For the voracious carnivores, 58% uh, of them make a shopping list, and that list is uh, that number will be in red when it pops up on your screen. It's significantly lower than the other other segments. 
there is um, the little white chat there is 6%, and that means that this group also is significantly lower. Ferocious carnivores really aren't setting it up with their friends about what recipes or meats to try. They kind of have a good handle on, on what they want to, to eat. 46% are checking prices and promotions. That number is in red because, again, it's lower than the average of the segments. It's still almost half of them, but it's not as high as some of our other, other segments. Uh, 22% also lower is checking out products, researching products, checking pricing online, uh, checking out things so that they know more before they go to the store. You'll notice the only green number on your screen is 26%. Well, that little red X is to indicate that they say, you know what, I don't really do anything to prepare before I go to the shopping trip and just get in the car and go. So as we look at these in totality together, what we quickly start to see is that the ferocious carnivore is a very routine shopper. They know what they like. They tend to purchase the same thing over and over again because it's in their rotation and they know how to prepare it. They're not highly price driven. They can be influenced by that. And they're not really uh, digitally connected. If we change and look at their in-store activities, we'll start to get to, to add to the picture of who this segment is. 55% of them index low, which is a low index for us, on being attached to or looking for a specific brand or product. Uh, they do look for additional information in circulars and on pack that could influence their purchase, which is 36% of them. And they also check prices and promotions once they get to the store, 64%. But again, the number's in black because it's in average across all of our, all of our segments. They are most unlikely to use a smartphone to assist them. So technology is not going to be the way to reach the segment because they're not going to whip out that smartphone and, and look some stuff up while they're, in, while they're in the store. We should also keep in mind that they're going to index low for specialty items like uh, antibiotic-free or hormone-free or cage-free um, as far as different specialty attributes. The next thing we want to look at is their attitudes. And this is a, a list of a long list of, of statements that we ask them to, to rate themselves on a scale of one to five on their attributes of whether that whether the statement uh, related to them or not. And based on our wordle, the larger the words, the more it related to them. So you can really see for our voracious carnivores, they love meat. They love the taste of it. They just can't get enough of it. They're not going to give it up. Uh, their entire family enjoys it. There's a lot of things about meat. But I'm guessing most of us on this call fall into this group. Michael and I are both ferocious carnivores. So this area is an area that's easy for us to think about and target to because they are more like what we are. So that's a look at their attitudes. Michael, you want to talk about the demographics? Sure. So in order to round out the, um, the, the sort of the visual of a profile for each of, this, uh, each of the segments, we also put together a, a top line demographic look and feel of who they are. Uh, we've got a lot of demographics available on each of these uh, cons uh, consuming groups, but we wanted to give you a feel with three or four that would allow you to kind of get a visual of what they look like. The first of those are um, uh, on gender. So what we have here is two black numbers, 51% were male and 49% were female, so they were fairly evenly split between the two genders. When we look at age, we've got a number of 53. The 53 is in green, which means that voracious carnivores index higher or um, their, age is, their average age is significantly higher than the average of the ages across all six segments. And in fact, 63% of voracious carnivores are boomers or seniors, and um, they are actually, this group is actually tied for the oldest segment along with the wavering budgeteers, who we'll talk about next. When we look at household income, we've got a red 74,000. That 74,000 is um, red because that means that their um, average household income is significantly less than the average across all the six segments. It's still a pretty high number if you think relatively speaking when you talk about medium incomes that, um, around the country, but the, the, the range of incomes within this group, within each of the segments is going to be somewhat broad, but on average they are at 74%. But in fact, 42% of voracious carnivores have an annual household income of less than $50,000. Dollars. The next indicator is household size. We have a red 2.7, which is significantly lower than the other segments. In fact, 44% have two member households or less, and only 29% indicated that they have kids living at home. Again, keep in mind the, the percentage that we're actually 
um, boomers or seniors within this segment. And then the last demographic uh, uh, indicator we're going to use is ethnicity. Here we see that 77% said that they are Caucasian and 13% said that they are of, of Hispanic descent. We also talked about regionality. As we mentioned earlier, we've got four regions we looked at. Um, for voracious carnivores, they index higher in the Midwest than any of the other groups. So these are really uh, folks that are from the heartland of America. In addition, we asked them whether they uh, lived in the suburbs, in, in urban America, in small towns, or in a rural setting. And this group, again, indexed higher in a combination of small town living and rural living. So that gives you an overview of our voracious carnivores. We've outlined consumption habits um, and behavior uh, perception habits, and then we also talked about demographics. The next thing we want to do is give you at a very high level uh, sort of our, our take on how we might think about uh, get, drawing the attention of these shoppers when, we are think, uh, when, when they're thinking about getting ready to, to uh, go to the grocery store and they're working at home preparing or when they get in home. It's going to be at a very high level. We've got a lot of information that we can dig deeper, but in order to uh, just give you a little feel for how you might position your opportunity against gracious carnivores, we wanted to dig into this a little bit. So the first question is, do we believe that there is a huge upside in growth potential for consumption for the voracious carnivores? Well, based on what we talked about, these are our heavy meat consumers. The upside in increasing consumption is probably not as significant as, honestly, some of the other segments that you're going to see. So instead of looking at a growth uh, platform here, we in fact thought the opportunity was more of one, maintain and defend. Again, strong, strong eaters. Um, we want to keep them in our court, um, and therefore we need to maintain that. We need to answer their needs, understand their needs, and answer their needs to keep them engaged with our products. How might we do that? Well, first of all, let's make sure we get added to their routine. These folks are creatures of habit. We need to make certain we remain on their list of meat, their list of meats to buy and we deliver on what they expect. And the kind of things they're looking for, as Danette mentioned, are taste, nutritional value, and enjoyment. About half of this, these shoppers do look at prices before they go to the store. That's about all they do when they're, uh, um, other than making a shopping list. So they don't spend a lot of time planning. Again, it's about their routine. If we can get focused on circulars at home and when we get into the store, provide them some information in a store circular at the point of sale, they'll probably um, take a look at it at those, uh, at those points to make some decisions. And then finally, they indicated that they like to eat both fresh and processed meats. Think variety. Draw them to different locations and convince them to buy. Danette, you wanted to introduce Wavering Budgeteers for us. Absolutely. Our second segment, the Wavering Budgeteers, makes up 13% of our population, and you can guess from the name what's probably most important to them. If we look at the types of proteins they consume, 6.1 uh, types of proteins in the time frame, so that's just a little bit less than our, um, our wavering, excuse me, our voracious carnivores. Th this group is different, though, because they, while they're the second highest they, and they eat a lot of a product, their approach to purchase and their attitudes is, is very different than the voracious carnivores. So let's dive into what that starts to look, look like. If we look at the second consumption indicator, the percent buying uh, once, a, once a month, 62% of them are, are doing that. That is actually the lowest, whether the number is red, it's the lowest of any of our segments. This group is very budget conscious. Meat is, is expensive for them. They like to look for new ideas and, and stretch their meal dollars. They also like to find personal ways to, to jazz it up. They don't they don't want to spend a lot on meat unless they have a coupon or they can, they can find it on sale. If we look at their trends in meat consumption, well, we've got some, some, some good things happening and some, some challenges here. So 26% of them uh, say that they've increased their consumption, which is significantly lower than the other segments. 28% say they've decreased, which is higher than the other segments. So really what we've got to do is find ways to offer them value and meet their needs of having the meat that's essential to their meal because they're, they're, they're meat eaters. They're very important to us as far as volume, but they're not going to be interested in our, our premium or high ticket items. If we look at their pre-shopping behavior, 
we're going to see that about 65% are into uh, making sure that they have a list before they, they go. They're, of course, going to be looking at coupons. We've got two areas in red here. They're not really doing a lot of research online or, or taking word of mouth, but they are going to be looking for, for those deals pre, to help them determine which stores they're going to, going to go to. Once they get in the store, if we look at their in-store activities, you'll see that there's some things that, that they're doing. Obviously, they're looking for promotional prices and can be swayed. Uh, they have some things there as far as the little red location indicator that they know that they're going to buy because they, they typically always buy them. They may be swayed by price on those or not. The one that's really interesting to me on this slide is the, is the green 44%. And that tells us that this group still can be influenced in store by the information they see either in the circular, on point of sale, or the information on package. So they're value shoppers, but they're also really wanting to know and learn about the products that they're purchasing. It gives us some interesting insight into them. That same insight is what we'll see in their attitudes here. So I've been talking about keeping budget issues and finding new ways to cook and meat not being as expensive, but look at the two words that are the biggest on the screen, those being sustainable agriculture. So while our wavering budgeteer is very much into cheaper prices and wanting coupons and stretching their dollar, they also rank high regarding their belief that meat should only come from farms that practice sustainable agriculture. This one feels like a little bit of an outlier to us, and we dug into it a little bit deeper. So this gives you an example of, of another, another question that we asked and we have for all, for all of the segments. But one of the really interesting things here is if she's got a little bit of extra money this week, she may trade up to a package that has that messaging on it because it helps her feel good about what she's serving to her family. So Michael, you want to dive into the demographics? Sure. We see some, some much different numbers here when we look at gender. We have 67% indicating that they're female, which is signi quite significantly higher than any of the other segments. In fact, it's 13 percentage points higher than the female uh, percentage in any of the other segments. We also have a red 33% for males, and that is significantly lower than any other male uh, number we had before. So this, this group really skews toward the female uh, gender. If we look at age, as I mentioned, they are tied with the voracious carnivores from an age perspective at 53 average. 65% um, of these consumers are either boomers or seniors. From a household income perspective, we're at 61%. It's the lowest household income of any of the segments. And in fact, 75% of this group have household incomes of less than 75,000. And almost a quarter, 22%, have a household income of less than $25,000. So that's where we get that wavering budgeteer name. When we look at household size, we've got a 2.7, which ties with the voracious carnivores is the lowest of all the segments from a size perspective. 57% have either one or two member households, and 21% live in single households. Only 30% uh, th or 30% do not have kids in the home. So we've got a third of them uh, saying that they do not have kids living in their households. When we look at the, dem at the ethnic ma uh, makeup, we've got 65% saying that they are Caucasian. That's significantly lower than the other segments. However, we've got two significantly higher uh, ethnic backgrounds here in black at 21% and Asian at 11%. And when we look at where they live around the country, from a regional perspective, they're evenly split across all regions. And um, the, the primary location for where they live is in suburban America, and that's at 42%. Jeanette, you want to talk about how we position to them? Absolutely. While our voracious carnivores, uh, we, we, we kind of categorize them as being huge meat eaters, we have to keep in mind that our wavering budget e budgeteers are also huge meat eaters. They just come at it from a very, very different angle with their needs and their approaches to shopping. So as we think about the opportunity for this group, we are putting them in the same category of maintain and defend because the opportunity, the likelihood of moving them up what we consider into, into more meat or different areas is, is slim. Very important for us to maintain them, very important for us to defend them. We don't want to lose them. But if we break down tactically how we can reach out and make sure that we continue to capture their meat dollars, it's really all about price. We've got to find the way to reach them pre-shopping to make sure that they put our items on their list. 
but also know that we can influence them in store, especially when they may have a little extra in, in their budget that month, uh, especially, and particularly with sustainable farming messages, we can reach them th that way. Two-thirds of them will make that shopping decision before they go, so it's very critical that we're reaching them outside of the store and not just inside the store. And also, we need to capitalize on in-store package messages because that, that packaging, you'll hear us talk about this multiple times today, but we're talking about it in different ways with each segment because each segment responds differently. So that packaging is really going to help sway a decision that she may have already made before she comes to the store. Our third segment that we're going to visit with you about is our premium players. And these folks make up 15% of the population. So when it comes to the type of, of proteins eaten in the last three months, the premium players average six, which is still pretty respectable. Uh, like the voracious carnivores and the wavering budgeteers, they like a variety of protein in their diet. Meat, meat is a, a vital part of their lifestyle. But their drivers are very different than either of the last two groups. These folks are really driven by their desire for variety, for convenience, and flavor. Budget is really not a factor that's, that's uh, that's causing a change in perhaps their meat purchasing decisions. If we look at how often they're buying the product, 70% of premium players report buying meat and poultry products on average at least once a month. They're, they're average shoppers with, you know, is, is regarding uh, frequency and purchase trends. And if we look at their meat uh, consumption trends and self-reported here, it's also very much average. Nothing we really want to highlight because it, it just falls right in line with, with what's we're doing across all of the segments. The story starts to look a little different, though, when we look at their pre-shopping behaviors. We put, put those up there. You know, we can see that really she and he are the, the premium shoppers aren't doing a lot to repair. They're still list makers. They're, they're a little bit more happening in the, in the word of mouth and the online area. But you can see those prices and those promotions that, that the wavering budgeteer looks for outside of the store. The premium player is not, not looking for those. She's, She's not focused on that because she's not as price driven. When we get her in the store, however, we can impact some of the things that she does, primarily through um, having things that she knows she always wants. Because she's going to be, she's pretty loyal in, in certain areas, and she about half of them are going to look for promotions and, and price reductions once they're in the store. 17% are using a smartphone to research product information. That's higher than we've seen of the other groups, but we're still going to see much higher as we move on through them. So our opportunities to impact her here really just depend on whether we're going to be on that list or we're, we're, she's already had a chance to try our product. Where she gets really interesting is in her attitudes. I think I've said that the last few times because these attitudes really help us to define each of the segments. So variety, flavor, and health are key themes for the premium player. You know, they enjoy meat that's part of ethnic meals. Frozen is as good as fresh. That comes down to that convenience and variety uh, drivers that they have. They also feel that non-meat alternatives are acceptable. You haven't heard me say those words to this moment, but we have to be aware that, that she and he will slide in and out of, out of meat protein uh, based on primarily convenience and variety. They look for low fat. They're going to choose quality over price. They're willing to pay more for the brands that they really like. And they tend to stop shop just in the same store, uh, which shows that they have some routine to them. For this segment in particular, and one of the beauties of segmentation that we can see across all the segments, up to this point, I've been sharing the things that they do. But for us to really see who this premium player is, it's important for us to understand what they aren't. So is it these statements like the following were things that they said, nope, that's not me, and they rated it really low on our scale. Statements like, I buy family-sized packs of meat because they're cheaper. Uh, statements like, meat is too expensive. Statements like, I would drive further to find cheaper prices of meat. So it's the balance of, of what they agree with and what they disagree with that helps us to understand this premium player even better. Michael? Okay, from a demographic perspective, this segment skews slightly high on the female side at 54%. From an age perspective, they have an average age of 49, which is on par with uh, the average for the six segments. Household income, though, um, is at 87,000 on average, which is significantly higher than we've seen in the average across all six segments. As I talked about, price, pricing is not a big issue for this group. Um, they they um, have a really solid um, household income. 
when we talk about household size, we're at 2.9, again, which is on average. 36% are in two-person households, and only 39% report, 39 report having kids at home. Ethnically, 69% are Caucasian. In addition, we've got 24% who are Hispanic and 19% reporting that they are black. Regionally, again, pretty evenly split around the country. We have 44% who report living in urban settings and 37% who live in the suburbs. So how do, we, how do we as an industry attract these shoppers? Well, we see premium players as a growth segment that needs to be nurtured. One way to do this is what we classify as cultivate with innovation. Tactically, we've got a group here that are very wealthy, and so tight budgets is not a, an issue for them. They thrive on convenience and uh, they're looking for shopping experiences. So one thing we wanna focus on are new packaging ideas, meal solutions uh, that include further prepared items. They will also look for ideas in the freezer case and potentially in the prepared foods area. So it's our opportunity to attract them to specific locations within our meat department and try to sell them up to products that we have added some value to in and taken, taken a little bit more effort in making them more convenient, more flavorful and adding a little variety. Flavor is a big deal for these shoppers. We want to we'll look to tie in ethnic dishes, provide options for the prepared items that offer things like spices, sauces, and marinades. And this group also focuses on their health. When messaging, be sure to provide nutritional information and provide options for low fat, low sodium, protein, zinc, and iron. This is a significant growth opportunity here, and we believe that if we communicate regularly with them, we'll, uh, that we'll give them uh, a whole variety of products that are gonna attract them to uh, our meat department. The next segment we wanna talk about is the aging idealist. This group also makes up 13% of our population. When we think about this consumer and we ask them about their consumption, they're still very solid meat eaters, they don't eat as wide a variety of proteins as our previous segments do, and they tend to be more mm, picky about what they eat, including the types of proteins that they, they purchase in and they consume. As far as their buying habits, they're regular buyers of meat and poultry products, and there's nothing really you know, the right and average here. And if we look at their trends as far as meat consumption, kind of the same story. Uh, and, it's what's happening here. We can, we have the ability to dive down here and, and look at specific uh, generations and other things inside of this, but as we look at this group as a whole, there's nothing really, really big to report on. As far as pre-shopping behavior, you know, they're, they're list makers that still, they are um, concerned about other things that are starting to impact how they shop because those things, as, a, as when I get into attitudes, we'll, I'll talk about them, they really kind of define who, who they are. 43% check for coupons, which is significantly lower than the others. This group tends to purchase based on their attitudes and beliefs. They don't depend on coupons and price coupons, uh, excuse me, price promotions. They uh, have some specialty, specific specialty products that they like and want to purchase, whether those products are on, on sale or not. If we look at their in-store activities, you know, half are going to uh, look at prices when they get in the stores, which is significantly lower again because they've, they've got their minds kind of made up on, on what, they're, what they're focused on and, and what they want to shop for. So price is not a big driver for this group. It's really more about what we see in this next slide on attitudes that makes this a huge, huge influence on our aging idealist. For the aging idealist, causes and beliefs are significant. So it's impacting not only what they're purchasing for me, but really every, every part of their life. Uh, key attributes and drive purchase behaviors for them are they really wanna, they wanna buy meat that was raised locally in the US. They wanna make choices that avoid any additives. So they're looking for free from products. They're looking for meats that, are, that come from humanely raised animals. They may be interested in grass-fed uh, products. They're, they're looking for things that are non-GMO items. They're really focused more in the, in the environmental area and they're gonna buy from companies that help protect the environment because that helps align with, with their beliefs. In addition, this group is looking for foods that are easy to prepare. Uh, they typically shop at the same store because they, they've grown to trust that store and the kinds of products that are, that are being offered. So it's slightly different than our other two groups in what is 
swaying them in the purchasing decisions for the meat that they're going to purchase. Okay, demographically, they're pretty evenly split, male, female. If we look at their age, they're at 51, which is right on average with the six segments. 30% of this group are seniors, and 20, only 22% are millennials. From a household income perspective, they're at 76,000, which is actually um, significantly lower than the average across all six segments. 46% of, of, of this group have an average household income of less than 50,000. Household size-wise, they're at 2.8. 21% are in, in, in one-person households, and 39% report having kids at home. From an ethnic perspective, 71% are Caucasian, 23% are black. This is the highest black percentage, uh, significantly higher than the other groups. And from a regional perspective, it's pretty evenly split across the country. The one statistic from a regional and, and where they live perspective that sticks out is that 14% actually said that they're from a rural setting, which is significantly higher than we've seen across the average uh, for the six segments. Did that, you want to pick up on these? Yeah, happy to. If we talk about the opportunities with this group and as we think about where, where can we gain more from them, we, we truly believe that, that we can because, because of where they are in, the, in their buying habits and because of where we are in the industry. So as, as a classification, we're going to say that, that this group, uh, if we meet their needs, we can sell them, them more. You know, they're, as the industry strives to be more transparent, more attribute specific, and more clear and concise in the products that we're offering, we believe it really opens a door to, to cater to this segment's needs. So tactically, how can we do that? The first one is, is to highlight those free from claims while being very transparent. Now, I, I should take a moment to pause and say those have to go together. They, because of, of their lifestyle and their beliefs, they have to see that we're being transparent in those claims and how those claim, claims come about. We also need to offer small package size options that are for value for this group because we've got a, 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 an older consumer here that isn't wanting the, the big family packs. And we need to focus on the nutritional values for, of the seniors as new health and nutrition is becoming more and more important to, to this segment as well. I'm going to switch gears now and talk about our next segment, the selective foodies. Now, the word selective here is probably the best one to, to key off of. Uh, we've talked about some, some folks being picky. Well, they're, they're pretty picky in their adventure for the, the types of products that they want to choose. They're 12% of our population. From the consumption perspective, they're pretty solid, uh, eating a variety at, at, at right at six types of protein consumed. And if we look at the indicator for that they purchase meat and poultry at least once a month, uh, that's at 72%, which is right, in, right inside our, our average. They're, they, how they trend as far as meat consumption, it's pretty much on par as well. And nothing really big and different to talk about inside of, of this group. Starts to get even more interesting as we look at their pre-shopping behaviors. So the selective foodies, they're doing some of the things we would expect. They're making a list. Word of mouth is becoming far more important. Uh, I'm guessing the Food Network's a, a big part of that, you know, where they find recipes, where they pay attention to. But look at that green 56% on our promotions and coupons. That stands out to me because this group wants the adventure of food. And they want to feel good about it. They need some, sometimes they need some triggers to get them to try it. So if they can find coupons before they go to the store, they're more apt to try out something new. If we look at their in-store activities, they're really much on, on par uh, with the, uh, the average of the segments with the exception of that 44%, which is just giant for us, so it's significantly higher than the other segments. This is the group that's going to read things in store. They're going to look at the point of sale. They're going to look at what's on the package. They're going to read the messages. They're going to use that smartphone to learn more. So they're about the adventure, but they also want to know that that, that adventure is backed up with the right, the right story. If we talk about the attitudes for the aging, uh, excuse me, for the selective foodies, it's very similar in some aspects to the aging idealist. Uh, they're heavily influenced by the attitudes and beliefs. So that they're into home cooked meals. So they believe they're much better than eating out uh, or having takeout. They like to, they really like meat. They, they're looking for meat that's, that's 
USDA certified label. They prefer well-known national brands. This group can be, can be extremely loyal. Uh, they're going to choose quality over price. They're going to stick to products that they know and trust. And they really enjoy experimenting with new foods. So health and wellness is very important to this group. And there is some interesting things that they also believe. There, the concerns that meat production is harming the environment, they believe that statement is overstated. So they don't really key on that like, say, an aging idealist would. Um, but there are, they're also skeptical of some of the negative commentary out there on meat, which means that they're pretty committed. They want to include meat in their meals. That's good news for us in the industry. Okay, and from a demographic perspective, uh, so selected foodies are more likely to be fe female than male. Their average age is at 51. Only 22% are millennials in this group. From a household income perspective, this is the highest number we've seen at 88,000 on average, which is significantly higher than we've seen in the other groups. Household size-wise, they are at 2.8. 41% of this group report having kids at home. And from an ethnic perspective, 72% are Caucasian, 25% are Hispanic, and that Hispanic number is significantly higher than we see across the average for all of the groups. When we look at where they're located around the country and where they live, from a, a regional perspective, the number that sticks out is at 42%, which is in the south. That's the highest number we've seen in the south. And um, from a location perspective, 41% said that they live in the suburbs, which is the highest percent that we've seen living in the suburbs. The combination of urban and suburban living for this group is at 88%. Okay, so what do we do when we're trying to focus on this particular group with our marketing and uh, uh, messaging campaign? Well. As we consider the opportunities for this group, we classify them along with the aging idealists under what we call the meet, meet their needs, sell them more. We feel that there's a huge opportunity for upside. It's just really truly understanding what she's looking for before she goes to the store and what she gets into the store and make sure that we have it available to fit her, her, uh, her needs. Tactically, we want to influence them through, their store, through store tactics. As Danette mentioned, they are very brand loyal and they check prices. They index high on looking for product information in the circular and on pack. We need to provide them with meal ideals that, that target uh, new products and, and different types of out-of-the-box thinking for them. We also can educate them on health benefits for meat proteins. From a brand-centric perspective, 77% of these shoppers indicated that they prefer brands. They're incredibly loyal shoppers. They stick with products that they know and trust. Remember, quality over price, nutrition over convenience. We need to spend time understanding their needs and then deliver to them. And finally, the whole concept of providing new ideas when she shops, they're planners, they make lists, they're creative cooks, they like to experiment and try new foods, they love to cook for their family. Give them new ideas. They're all about new ideas. They also index high on uh, researching online, so that means that we need to meet them where they look digitally to find information. So we've got about 15 minutes left in our webinar, and we're up to our sixth and final segment that we're going to share. If you've got questions, please do put them in the chat. Uh, add to the ones that we've already got. We're going to have time to answer questions before we get going. Now, for, for you math geeks, that are, have been listening in, you've probably been keeping track of our population, and you know that in the first five groups, we've, we have, we've still got about a third of the population we haven't talked about. And that would be these urban eclectics. 33% of our population base, based on their names, I think you can probably guess what, who dominates this group, the millennials, 41%. Gen Xers make up 30% of this. So Gen Xers and millennials make up just over 70% of of this key segment. The segment is, is really interesting because of the dynamics uh, of being do uh, dominated by this, by this younger generation. And as, as we dug into it, uh, our efforts really, we thought this segment was too big and we wanted to, to try to cut it up, but it really, there's a lot of things uh, attitudinally that hold this segment together. We did sub-segment this group because it's so large. And we're not going to take time today to walk through each of those subsegments, but to see that you know in the full report and the information we have, subsegments do exist inside of, inside of this group. 
it's one of, this is the first time you've seen a red number as far as types of protein consumed. And if that doesn't concern you, uh, then let me alarm, alarm, sound the alarms. It should. Only 5.5 types of, of protein consumed for this household in the last three months. So obviously it's the lowest number that we are going to report across the segments is significantly lower than the segment average of 5.8. This group tends to be more focused on their meat purchasing. Uh, they're driven by price and convenience. This is also the group that didn't have home ec, so they don't know how to cook as well as everyone else, and that's really showing up, showing up here. What's interesting is the other side of this and they can, as we look at these consumption uh, data, because their frequency in the store buying meals is the highest that we've seen. So the, few, the, the least amount of variety, but they're spending more time in the stores, they're thinking about and purchasing meat more often. So the opportunity to message to them and to reach them is, is there. We just need to go grab it. If we look at the tr their trends as far as meat consumption, we've got some interesting things going on here. The good news is that 37% of them say, I'm, I'm in I've increased it. That's fabulous considering how big this group is and how much room we know that we need to, to grow them because they are a big part of our future. The 14% in red, of course, is a concern for those that are, are decreasing. Now, if you step back and think of the other five segments, this is the only time we've had four green numbers on the screen. The big indicator here was we've got to reach them before they go to the grocery store. There is definite pre-shopping planning happening here. So they're making lists, they're talking to their friends, they're looking for prices and promotions because they are on budget and they're online. And if you're not, they're not going to be talking to you because community is such a big, big piece of what they choose to eat. So pre-shopping wise, there has to be a strategy for reaching them before you ever, before they ever go to the store. That strategy, though, has to continue when they're in the store if we look at their activities because they can be and will be influenced by, their, uh, by prices and promotion at 69%, which is significantly higher, a, a huge number. And if you look at that 30%, that's where the smartphone comes in. They're researching things in, in store. They're looking up websites. They're looking at prices of other places. They're looking for a recipe. So that connection with that small computer device that they're always have in their hand continues even when they're doing their grocery shopping. Now, these urban eclectics are very brand loyal while being budget driven. And so I, sometimes it feels like I'm talking out of both of my sides of my mouth on this group. It, that's, it's just a complex group. The sub-segments uh, do provide some more insight into that, and we'll be happy to share that with you later. If we talk about the attitudes, we've got some, some fun things to talk about here. You know, their attitudes and beliefs are, are absolutely influencing uh, their behavior. Some, some statements that I haven't shared with you that will show you some variety across the statements that were asked of, of all of the 2,200 people that, that took part in our survey. Statements like, meat cooking should be quick and simple that they always make a list, that they're looking for meal shortcuts. We know that they're brand loyal. Um, they prefer food and recipes that fit their cultural traditions. They rely on convenience products. They're willing to pay more for food from companies that support their causes. That's a message we've heard from the millennials for some time. But we're also facing some challenges from, from our urban eclectics because they believe at times that meat takes too long to cook, that it's hard to cook meat perfectly, and something I haven't shared that, that troubles me to have to say is the fact that they say that, yes, eating meat is becoming less socially acceptable. Ouch. So we've got to find ways to keep drawing them in because, quite frankly, they're a, they're a mixed bag in, inside of, of this segment. Michael? Okay. Demographically, there are more males than females in this group. This is the first time we've seen an average age this low. Obviously, that's because it's, it's uh, populated primarily by millennials and Gen Xers. The average age was 40, which is significantly less than the other segments. This is also the highest income, an annual household income number we've seen at 92,000. 56 percent of, uh, of this group have income higher than 75,000, and 40 percent of them actually have incomes higher than 100,000. So these folks have money. However, they continue to be uh, budget conscious and somewhat frugal because of this number. 
They also have the house, highest household size at 3.4, which is significantly higher. Half of these uh, consumers have four or more individuals in their household, and 61% said that they have kids in their household. So this is where all the families are. Ethnically speaking, 75% um, said they're uh, Caucasian, 24% Hispanic, and 14% black. And from where they live in the country, this is the group that indexes high on the West Coast. Um, and they also index high in living in urban America. And in fact, 88% of this group live in either the urban, an urban or a suburban setting. So what can we as an industry do to approach this group? As Vanette said, this is a tough one because we've got a lot more content in the three subcategories that we have of this group. Um, but we're going to try to give you a feel for, in general, what we're dealing with given the age of, age of uh, category that we're working with here and the fact that they're higher income, larger families, etc. We think this is probably the group that provides us with the biggest opportunity for growth and that would be through cultivation with innovation. How do we do that? Well, they're, they're feeding a lot of folks so we need to provide options to feed them. They have large households and even though they tend to have higher household incomes than the general population, they are still on tight budgets. They're, 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 they tend to be somewhat frugal. We need to be online and smartphone friendly. This group is very connected and very social. If you're going to get to, to be able to reach them, we need to be to, to go beyond traditional communication vehicles and have a solid digital presence. And finally, we need to focus on cultural foods. These consumers love flavor. They love variety. Um, they're very ethnic focused. They love to um, get foods within their cultural traditions. Um, so we need to be creative with this group and provide them with a lot of options that give them that variety they're looking for with some amazing flavor profiles. Okay, Michael, with that, we're going to try to wrap up here to take some, to have some time for questions that uh, Maggie is, is looking through right now. We, and we really appreciate the fact that, that you guys have taken time this afternoon to, to learn about these key segments. As we wrap this up, we, you know, we sat back and looked at this as kind of where is the opportunity in the meat industry and, and what is our strategy across our arrow of opportunity. Here at the bottom of the arrow is the maintain and defend group. Those are our wavering budgeteers and our voracious carnivores. We think for them, we, you know, they're, they're big volume for us. They're, they're very important for our throughput. We're probably not going to move them up but we need to maintain them and continue to make sure that meat is going into that cart and they're going home to eat our products. In the middle section of our arrow is the meet their needs and sell them more group. So these are our selective foodies and our aging idealists. The positioning to them is both is very different on, on both fronts, uh, but we need to pay attention to them because if, we, if we're meeting their needs, they're, they're going to eat more of our products. And finally, at the top of our arrow is the cultivate with innovation. These are our premium players and our urban eclectics. You know, these folks have different needs, very different needs, and, and demands really of us as the meat industry. Uh, the good news is that they are, are willing to reward us if we change with them and we keep them engaged because they're just not crazy about the same old boring meat. They want to continually be trying new things and, and having new experiences in the meat industry and, and we are forced to create this for them. So as you've been listening, I'm hoping that you've had a chance to think about the brands or the products that you're selling and where they might align across uh, each, of, each of these different segments in our arrow of opportunity. Maggie, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thanks, Danette. Thanks, Michael, for today's um, meat consumer segment from that deep dive. Um, I want to share that there is so much more available in our full report. And so what you've heard today is simply the top line. And based on your demands that we saw at the annual meat conference last month, we were making that full report available for purchase. And that consists of 87 total slides. So visit the website on your screen called segmentation.com to find details there about um, how you can contact us to learn more about all the different ways we can slice and dice the data specific to your business, your protein, and your company. Um, so our market research team is standing by. Okay, let's dive into some great questions that have come up on the screen. Number one, how can we learn more about the subgroups of the urban eclectics that you mentioned? 
I'll jump in for that one. We, we actually have a, a deep dive into each of the three subgroups. There are three classifications, urban, urban eclectics, earthbound eclectics, and hesitant eclectics. We have that information. We did share a little bit during the annual meet conference because we had a little more time, but we wanted to make time for Q&A. Please give us a call. We can provide you with, with some of that content. As well, we have a handout if you go to www.meetsegmentation.com that includes a summary, a top line summary of eight slides. It talks about the methodology of the study, et cetera, but it does provide a, a high level overview of the six core segments and the three sub segments within the urban eclectics. Next question Do you have any specific on pack health messages that resonate with the premium players segment? Michael, I think I, I can take that one and then you can jump in if you like. The, the, the great thing about the, the premium player is they're, they are health conscious. They are going to pay attention to health and their lifestyle and how it fits. So when we look at some of the a, a variety of the questions that we ask them and how they scale on those questions, uh, it, it starts to give you a feel for where health is important and where other things might be more important. like flavor. Uh, so it's, I wouldn't say that we have, yes, we can get to that. We can get to that through the kind of statements that they answered, but it's not just about health. It's a much broader approach for the premium player. Michael, you want to add to that? Yeah, no, I agree, Danette. It, it is pretty broad, but if you wanted to look on, on, on the specifics, health, um, you know, flavor and those kinds of things, we went through a, a series of, um, of uh, attitudinal statements that they responded to, and we've got um, the the level of agree or disagree with the statements as well. So using that information, you can get a good feel about where their heads are at and what kinds of positioning, what kinds of statements that we had listed in our in our survey that they seem to gravitate toward, which could be good indicators of what we need to be focused on to really resonate with with premium players uh, when we're trying to talk to them. Did any of the segments you toward any particular store format? I'll take that one. Yes, they did. We actually have, we, we asked all, all consumers where they shop for food, and then we drilled down into, okay, where do you shop for meat? And we do have that information, um, supermarkets, super centers, butcher shops, online. We've got uh, information on who shops, on, who said that they on, shop online is one of the alternatives that they use. Um, all of that will be in the final report. Um, we can, we can make it available through there. If you have any specific information on one of the segments and where they might shop, um, give us a call and let us know and we can help you with that. Does this research drill down into how each segment and their specific attitudes about antibiotic-free and no antibiotics ever claim? It does. Uh, we can give that across all of them. I, I touched briefly on the fact that the voracious carnivores don't care much about that. Uh, the aging idealists care more, but even inside of, say, the selective foodies, there there is a, a group there that that's in, important to. So, you, so yes, through the questions we asked, we can pull that out. And, and one of the great things about segmentation and the way it works is we could look at a specific uh, brand's attributes and, and help overlay the segment on those brand attributes, or we could look at a specific group of consumers and say they would line up more with these types of attitudes towards, say, antibiotic-free or hormone-free. So, so the answer, simple answer is yes, it's available in the report. I'll just throw in there as well. Um, we, we covered topics in our, in our attitudinal per, and perception uh, sections on antibiotics and hormones, on grass-fed, on organic, on all-natural, on GMO use, on cage-free, so that we, we, we tried to cover the gamut, and so we have information on responses for each of the segments on all those different topics. And I, what can you tell us? That, Maggie, right, sorry, Maggie, right quick. Um, the, the full report outlines that within these segments, but the way we built it on purpose uh, is to help, help folks understand how it works within there. So customized work can be done to get very specific into your area. Thank you. One last question, um, and I think this one is really relevant given today's marketplace. What can you tell us about whether any of these segments are likely to shop online or through other alternative retail channels? 
Oh, that's a fun one because that's been a hot topic for quite a while. So we've got that. We ask that question. When we ask them where they shop, we know which segments are, are doing that or have uh, been playing in that world. Certainly it's, it's, a, it's a very, very small niche for meat right now in particular, uh, but we expect it to grow. So, so that is, is there. Um, for, for what we shared at AMC, we haven't drilled down to give you specifics, so I can't even give you a peek on each side of each one. I just know that when we looked at the overall data, we've got that for each of the segments. I will well, tell thank you, that you everybody. On, on, uh, Maggie, let me just jump in here real quick. Um, from a past three-month purchase location for meats and poultry perspective, across all segments, 11% um, say that they're shopping online. They've, they've shopped online in the past three months. And then oh, we've, thank got, you, Michael. we've got percentages for all the different segments. Um, obviously, urban eclectics will, will uh, be significantly higher than that number. Well, we appreciate your time this afternoon. For a, a, additional questions that were asked during the annual meat conference, you guys can go to meatconference.com backslash program to see the Q&A from all the questions that were asked there. And again, we really appreciate your time this afternoon. Visit us at nightinmarketing.com and also segmeetation.com to learn more about how you can access the full report. Thank you, guys. Have a great afternoon. We really appreciate you attending today. Thank you.